Welcome back to the Believe in NFL Draft Prospects podcast. I am Joe DeLeon, joined by my co-host, NFL Draft Analyst, Ryan Roberts. We're almost done with our positional rankings, and we're doing a position group that isn't as deep and as talented as the other defensive position groups. Today, we are talking defensive tackles. Ryan, you've been uh, a little bit dissatisfied with this defensive tackle group. I feel like every time I've kind of loosely brought up, we're going to talk about defensive tackles, or I just bring up the word defensive tackle, you share your displeasure with, with this group. Uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to be Mr. Debbie Downer or anything, but it's, I mean, outside of the center group. Yeah, you're right. Somebody has to be in this world. Um, But outside, outside of the center position, this might be the worst position in the drafts, just far as, I don't think that I don't think the top is as strong as some people act like it is, and I also don't. I mean, I think most people would agree that the depth isn't great either. Mm-hmm. So, it's we're back to back years, man. We're just the interior defensive line class has just not been great. So, luckily, the edge group kind of makes up for the lack of interior talent. But it's, I mean, I, I just don't think it's a great class. I think it's a good class when you if you just need a true nose type right like a one tech guy that can do patrol the run game like those types of dudes i think there's some in this class but i think what's really absent of this class is like a true three tech that could be a somewhat high volume sack guy for an interior player like i just don't see a lot of upside as far as like interior pass rushers i just don't see it in this class right now yeah there's certainly some really big names that sit atop this class guys like Jordan Davis, Devontae Wyatt, Travis Jones building some hype. And and we're going to go into talking about these players. Ryan's got a bit of a surprise. I know it's shocking that Ryan has a surprise player at number one that's different than than, than the consensus, but we're going to get to that player. No spoilers yet. Before we get to that, though, folks, I do want to tell you about today's sponsor, which is Bet Online. Our partners at Bet Online continue to be the number one source for all of your betting needs and sports info. Find all of the latest sports developments, including odds, updated odds on the NBA playoffs, fights, and even next season's futures. And don't forget that the MLB is back as well. Who are you picking to win the World Series? BetOnline is your continued source for all of your sports wagering needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino and poker games. It's super easy to get started, so head to BetOnline today on your mobile device or, or their website. And use promo code believe that's B L E A V to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online where the game starts. All right, Ryan, talking defensive tackles. So you indicated that there's not a lot of depth, and that means if we're pulling a sleeper, you decided to do an extremely deep pull. You went with Sam Roberts, no relation to Ryan Roberts. Three less man. Western Missouri State. I, who is this guy? I don't. I've never heard of him before. Who is this? <laughs> <laughs> Northwest Missouri State, man. Nice little Division Two pool for for everybody out there. He is a six foot four, six foot five, two hundred ninety plus pound um, athlete who also has Joe nearly thirty five inch arms, an eighty two inch wingspan. So this is a long, athletic dude that played a lot on the edge for Northwest Missouri State. I believe he went to the. NFL PA Bowl, if I remember correctly, maybe the East West Shrine. I think it was the NFL PA, though, now that I'm just kind of thinking off the top of my head. So this is a long athletic kid who's played a lot on the edge, but he profiles best inside. I think for a 3 4 team that plays a lot of odd man front, I think as a 5 tech, 4 4 I type player, this kid's length and athleticism is a lot of deserving of potentially a late round draft selection. And if, if, not, if he does not get drafted, I think this kid has a long-term outlook to make a roster, maybe not an immediate 53 man his first year, but he's definitely a practice squad worthy player. And I think he's got upside down the line. He's a good athlete on the interior, a lot of upside with, with Sam Roberts. I wouldn't be surprised if he was a rotational player in the NFL in a couple of years. What, what level of football is Northwestern Missouri state division two, sir. Division two, division two. Okay. Interesting. I, I didn't even, didn't even know that was a school. So here we are bringing up Northwestern Missouri state football players. Um, Ryan on the flip side of things, most overhyped guy who's getting maybe a little bit too much coverage. You went with Perry and Winfrey from mm-hmm. Oklahoma. If I remember correctly, Winfrey was one of the, wasn't he the the MVP of the Senior Bowl, or am I mixing him up with somebody else? I think you're right. I think you're correct. 
So since that time, he actually, I mean, legitimately has built up some hype. And I, during his senior bowl week of practice was considered to be one of the top performers. And I, I mean, I admit, caught my attention a little bit, thought he looked pretty good during those practices. I have not done the deep dive on the film that you have, but why do you think that Winfrey has been overhyped? Is it simply just because he's being pushed up in a way too high of a range that he's likely not going to get selected at? This happens every single draft season from the all-star circuit, man. There's some promising football players that get pushed up just way too high. So to your question, yes, it's exactly the problem right now. Perry and Winfrey is an incredibly gifted athlete. There is no doubt. He was number one Juco prospect a couple years ago, went to Oklahoma, had some production, but it was just very up and down. I, but I think when you're talking about first step quickness, it's really impressive stuff. He's got some flexibility. He's one of the few guys, you know, I talked a little bit that there's not a ton of upside as interior pass rushers. He could be one of those guys that has some interior upside. Like I think that he could be a starter down the line. But right now, people are talking about him as a top 50 pick, and I just I think that's going to be value, valued way too high. His pad level is atrocious, gets just beat up off of blocks, man, gets displaced out of gaps. He's certainly an impressive athlete, but I think that he is going to unfortunately be the person that is overdrafted a little bit this year, where after year one, people are going to look at him and say, like, man, I don't know if he's any good, but it's just the fact that he should not have been drafted that high. He needs to be taken along a little slowly. I think he could play year one in the sense that he could play some snaps as a pure interior rusher on obvious passing situations. But right now, I think that people are just kind of pushing him up a little bit too high comparative to what he is right now. Yeah, Winfrey, it feels like since, like we just talked about, since the senior bowl, he has been this this you know this big riser and again the, the guy's talented it's not that we're saying he's a bad football player but like we tend to do there's always going to be somebody that just gets pushed up way higher than the expectation there's and the, the top five that we're going to go through here it's a talented group and he's probably not really going to crack that that top five list that we have no not not for me he's not because like i said i think that the upside is way higher than the floor right now the floor scares me a little bit and mm. Sometimes when those things are just too far apart, that's where you kind of get paused a little bit. Like I can get really excited about the upside. And again, if we're talking about him in the third or fourth round, I would get very excited about that upside. But right now, I just think there's too many peaks and val valleys for me to be overly excited about Perry and Winfrey because I just think there's going to be a long road to being a substantial um, difference maker and producer on the next level. All right. Top five time for the defensive tackles. At number five, we have a Stanford football player, and I know this is somebody who you're super high on. Um, he's one of your guys during the cycle. You've brought him up on on different occasions when we've talked about underrated players in the class. Thomas Booker from Stanford. I have no idea if there's any relation um, to Corey Booker, who was previously a tight end at Stanford, but here he no. is. There's no, there's no relation? <laughs> Not that I know of. Well, it sounds like you don't know for sure. <laughs> but number five, why does Thomas Booker fit there at number five? I mean, I mean, it's similar a little bit to Perrion Winfrey. I think that Thomas Booker is a really gifted athlete. He came to Stanford as a highly recruited defensive end, was a four-star, very highly ranked kid, was about 6'4", 270 pounds coming out of high school. He's just kept growing. Now he's 6'4", 305, 310, 315. Like he's kind of fluctuated in that ballpark, but – He's a really gifted athlete, has a dynamite first step. There's some reps, Joe, where like you just he's able to split gaps. And you're just like, oh, that's that's a little different of movement skills for an interior defense lineman. And he's just a lot more consistent in the run game than a player like a Perry and Winfrey right now. Like he stays mm -hmm. square, he's got good leverage, he plays with good pad level. I think that Stanford misused him a little bit because they were asking him to play five tech, four, four eye. They were asking him to two gap a ton as well in that system. In a perfect world, I want this kid to just kind of be unshackled as a three-tech and just go because I think he's a gifted athlete. I think he has some interior presence to him. I think that he has upside as a starter on the next level. Unfortunately, I just think that he was just a part of a Stanford team that just was not very good. Their defense wasn't good. They asked him to do a little bit too much at times when I think in a one-gap penetration-style defense – this kid has difference-making potential. So I'm going to be higher on Thomas Booker than most people. I would draft him somewhere late day two, like third round. I would be, and I, I'd be very okay with it because I think that the upside is is still there, and I think that the floor is is very solid as well. I, I would be surprised if Thomas Booker wasn't at least a 
part-time rotational producer in the, on the next level because I, I think that his athletic traits are really nice to, to work with. Sliding up to number four, and I even said this to you before the show, you have this guy a little bit lower than I think the consensus. I think Devontae Wyatt from Georgia has been brought up as a, a near lock to be a first-round pick. A lot of people are, are considering him to be the second defensive tackle off the board behind Jordan Davis. But here you are slotting him at number four, meaning he's probably going to be a, a day two pick a, a, at some point. Why are you maybe not as high on Devontae Wyatt as some other people are? Yeah, I mean, he's going to go in the first round, I think. At, at least, if not, he's just going to go early, very, very early second round. I think he's a second round player. And there, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, man, because he is a... He probably might be the most flexible athlete on this list outside of my number one. Like this kid really changes direction well. He's able to squeeze through gaps. Incredible! Like he gets skinny. There's just there's good gap penetration skills here. I think that he's a little under overrated in the ter- in the world of play strength. I don't think that he's a guy that really st- you know works kind of leverage as well as some players do in this class. I think that he's a really nice athlete, kind of like a lot of these players are. I mean, he ran 477 at the Combine, so like this kid can get moving a little bit. First step is nice. I think the upside is there too because at Georgia in that three-man, in that three-down system, he's asked to two-gap a ton as well. He's asked to work double teams and do all kind of the dirty work. I think White has more upside than that. It's just... I think the play strength isn't great, but I certainly think that he's a starting level caliber player at the next level. Could be a difference maker, but that's just assuming that the play strength gets a little better than it is right now. So we're continuing on here, and the guy that you have for number three is, I, I think he makes sense at three, but he's somebody who typically has not been ranked over Devontae Wyatt, but Travis Jones from UConn. Talk about a darling from the, the all-star circuit. I think once people went and looked back at, at Travis Jones, they realized how freaking strong this kid is and how much of a bully he can be inside. But here he is at number three. A little bit weird seeing a guy from UConn rank that high in his position group. What makes him number three? And realistically, where do you see him getting drafted? I know you love your New England guys, man. So I had to get him. Yeah. I, had to get him up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, I almost put Travis Jones at number two. I, I'm a big fan wow. of Travis Jones, man. I'm a big fan. I, I have a late one, early two on Travis Jones. He's a oh. gifted football player. I mean, six foot four plus, 34 plus inch arms, 325 pounds. I mean, ideally, he's a one tech at the next level, but I think he's got some gap trend penetration skills too. Like you see some flashes of some really nice stuff. Kind of reminds me a little bit of Dexter Lawrence that came out of Clemson a few years ago that the New York Giants drafted in the first round. Like I think he's a much more, much better athlete than his body type would suggest. And he's going to do a lot of the dirty work, and he did a lot of the dirty work with UConn, which I think is why he went into the draft process a little underrated because, I mean, there just wasn't a lot around him, right? Like, they knew that they had to they had to stop number 57. The offenses knew they had to stop him on every single snap. So I think that he has unlimited upside. I mean, I think that as a one-tech knows, I, I think he has some Akeem Hicks to his game. I think he can patrol the run game, dominate, and I think he could be a guy that quietly has six to seven sacks a year, and you're just kind of like, oh, that's better pass you know, production than we maybe anticipated as, as a pass rusher, but I just think that there's a lot of upside to a guy like a Travis Jones, man. Fast, aggressive, physical, Great body to work with. I mean, he can. Ju- I think he can fit into I- any system too, like three, four, four, three, whatever, whatever scheme that you run. I think that he's a very scheme diverse player with with upside as a pass rusher as well from the interior. So I'm a big fan of Travis Jones, man. I almost put him at number two, very close. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people do like Travis Jones, but I, I didn't realize that you were you were this much of a fan of Travis Jones. It's that's interesting to hear. Yeah, man. I, I mean, he's Joe again. I I think, I think his. I think he was a little underrated as far as his film because I thought his film was really good. It's just a simple fact that like he's getting double teamed every single play, man. Like you again, do you yeah. know that you have to stop fifty seven? And even when he's getting double teamed, he's not getting moved. It's just a stalemate, which right. that's awesome. You're supposed to do yeah, that. Yeah, that, lo- that looks able- good, but it, or it looks good from our perspective. It's not sexy from anybody else's perspective because you just see a defensive tackle getting double teamed. Right, and I mean at, at the position that he plays too, like he's not going to jump off the stat sheet at you, right? Like, I think at the next level, though, he could be a 
10 tackle for loss type of guy, six to seven sacks. Like I think he could be that a year on top of being just a dominant player in the run game, like absolutely dominant. So again, I, th- I think that his upside is tremendous. Him and my number two player coming up, I think it's almost interchangeable. I think there's some things that Travis Jones does better where you could say like, oh, maybe he has a higher upside. But then my number two is just that he's just so dominant in the run game. So I think that's just kind of where the separator is. Yeah, Travis Jones, certainly not easy to stand out when you're the the best player on UConn, which is the worst team in college football, because you're going to get double teamed. That's going to happen. Uh, number two, though, you you hinted at who your next player is. Jordan Davis from Georgia, who lit the world on fire with the performance he had at the NFL Combine. Runs a stupid fast 40 out a massive weight. This is a behemoth of a human being. You slotted him at number two, and I think that they're at one time or another, there's been this hype that he's like a top 15 pick, but we do need to be a bit realistic on his usage. He's probably going to need to drop maybe a little bit of weight so he can spend some more time on the field. But he's not a three-down player right now. Regardless, you have him at number two. Why does he make sense at number two, and what are the things that you like about him? I mean, he's the most dominant run-stopping defensive tackle I've probably have ever seen. Like He reminds me a lot of John Henderson that played for the Jacksonville Jaguars. I mean, he's a 6'6-plus, 341-pound player that has vines for arms. And like you said, he ran 4'7-8 at the, at the combine, so he's a historical tester as well. Like This is an incredible linear athlete with incredible explosiveness. So I think there's still some projection to him where you could say like he maybe could do more, but the, the I mean the fact of the matter is is he just he didn't do more at Georgia. Like he was a dominant player in the run game. You cannot double team him. You cannot stop him with one player. Like it just is impossible to just counteract and completely neutralize Jordan Davis in the run game. And you see flashes at times of him pushing the pocket, but like you just don't see it enough where I would be content with going top 10 top 15 top 20 even though i still think that he has a chance to go ultimately in the top 20 like i think that that's very possible so i think he's going to just get a little draft a little higher than i would draft him personally because this past year i think he played 40 percent of the snaps pretty sure dame brugler from the athletic put out a post before that in his georgia career he played 23 percent of the snaps so like this guy just doesn't play a high volume of snaps and are you really going to draft a player top 20 that is going to play less than 50 percent of the snaps potentially like that's that's where the conversation comes into i would be willing to draft him late first round to a contending team like if there's a team that maybe is just you know a, a rock, like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for teams that pops out to me, right? Because even though they have Vita Vea, they have luxury to the roster. The roster is very good all the way around. They can take a guy that might not be a high volume producer, but can be dominant in the snaps that he plays, at least early on in his career. So I think for a playoff team, championship level team, I think that that Jordan Davis makes a lot of sense and he can be dominant in what he does. I'm just not sure that he's ever going to be the player on obvious passing situations that's going to warrant him being a twenty top 20 player in a class, but certainly going to be a very good football player. He's got a high floor because he's going to be absolutely dominant in the run game. Do you think that he's somebody who needs to lose weight in order to, to compete at the level that maybe we hope? Not necessarily because he, I mean, he played at like 360. He was like 360 last spring. And I, huge. I, yeah, and he, I know he played well over 350 this past year and he, he lost weight to 341. At the comments, so like maybe he plays at 341, but either way, I mean, he's a historical mm-hmm. tester for 341 pounds. So at some point, right. you know, how much weight, how much weight are you going to lose to try to like unlock that potential? Because I don't think it's a hindrance on athletic talent. I just think it's the role that he plays, honestly. Well, so uh, that, that's kind of what I'm getting at. It, it's I'm not suggesting it like he's not moving well enough. I feel like one of the issues that gets brought up with him is maybe stamina and his ability to, you know, be in the right shape and he is a a very athletic guy at 340 but he also doesn't you know he looks like he could stand to lose like 10 pounds and I think he might be might move a tiny bit better but the bigger concern might be how much longer can he stay on the field I mean that that could be possible that could be possible I think though that the the hindrance for him as far as like from a production perspective is that it's kind of the same thing with Travis Jones to a degree they they're just not like Jordan Davis is never going to be a three tech, right? Like he's never going to be a, a true interior pass rusher. I think if he gives you four to five sacks a year, you're like, okay, that's fine because he's an absolute dominant player in the run game. So I think it's more role than actual 
an actual limitate. Like, I don't think there's a limitation from him from an athleticism perspective. I agree. Like he could definitely be a more durable player, right? Like I think that he could play a high volume of snaps, but even if he plays a high volume of snaps, I just don't know if his production's ever going to be to the highest degree. Cause just cause the role he plays, if that makes sense. All right. Last up, Ryan, we have DeMarvin Leal from Texas A&M. So we need to preface this by saying, I, it's not so much, I'm sure that you do think that Leal is better than Jordan Davis, but I think some people might characterize Leal as an edge, and some people might characterize DeMarvin Leal as a defensive tackle. So there is a little bit of disagreement on where he projects just because he is a little bit of a tweener based on his build, based on how he projects at the ne next level. So it yeah. sounds like you have him as a defensive tackle. And why do you think he's a defensive tackle? Yeah, I mean, I think he's a three tech waiting to happen, man. And I think that there's some three, four teams that could even look at him and say, like, you could be a five, you could be a four, four I, because you could play a little bit outside your frame. But I think that he needs to get this notion out of his mind that he's his true edge, because I just don't think he is. You know, he he weighed in at 283 pounds and ran right around five flat in the 40. Like he's just not, he's not an edge rusher in a traditional sense. Mm -hmm. What he is, though, is he's a very gifted athlete. I talked about flexibility a little bit earlier in the show. Um, with a guy like a Devontae Wyatt. Uh, man, it is tough to find a more flexible interior player than DeMarvin Leal. And despite him being an inconsistent football player, still had eight and a half sacks last year for Texas A&M, had double-digit tackles for loss. This kid's a freaky athlete on the interior. And I think once he kind of gets out of the notion that he's an edge, his flexibility and first step is going to be just a menace to interior offensive linemen. Like, I think that's where his biggest advantage is going to take. Upside is tremendous. I think he could be a... Richard Seymour esque type of football player that could play in a three, four or a four man front. I think he's that type of, of difference maker on the next level. I just think that he, again, he just needs to get out of his head a little bit that he's a true edge. If you use this kid as a versatile defensive lineman that can play up and down the line of scrimmage in a penetration style defense, I think this kid has some high volume pass rush potential. I think he could be a, a nice little sack guy on the on on the NFL level. So I'm still not quitting the Marvin Leal. I know his draft process hasn't been fantastic. There's there's definitely I mean there's definitely smoke around the league that he's not going to get drafted till second round. And like I buy it a little bit, but ultimately I think that his upside is just the highest in the class. There you have it, the Marvin Leal defensive tackle number one. So it, I just you kind of hit on it there. Right, last thing before we wrap wrap up here, do you think based on if if he's moved to three tech and he's he's not playing on the outside as much, you think that that is is what pushes him ahead of of Jordan Davis in terms of his impact? Yeah, because I I think the thing that hurt him most is the fact that he played all up and down Texas A and M's off defensive line, but he played the majority on the edge, right? So like he has never been in a position where it's like this is your role, this is what you're going to do. I think when he kind of gets to that standard, and he gets to two ninety plus, and he's that true three tech at six three plus and thirty three inch arms, like that's where I think that kind of gets unlocked for him. So I still think he's a really gifted athlete, really flexible on the upside, is ex extensively there. And he could play some edge in, you know, some situational roles. Like there's some there's some spots where he can, but I think on the interior, his upside is just so much higher. Well, folks, thank you for tuning in to today's defensive tackle rankings. We've got edge, we've got corner, and then I think we're done. And then we're going to start going crazy with hot takes and other various fun topics before the NFL draft. It, it's right around the corner. We're almost there. So make sure you're caught up. Don't miss out. Hit the subscribe button at Joe DeLeon at Rise and Draft. Talk to you later, folks. Enjoy the rest of your week.